we have a very dynamic and esteemed and innovative group of panelists. Before I turn the mic to the panelists, I'd like to uh, quickly set the stage for our discussions today. But in practice, Community Solar has evolved to cover collective action to finance, to purchase, to manage, and generate solar power locally. Community solar projects have an emphasis or have the following key attributes, uh, local ownership, local engagement, management and control, and local communities benefiting collectively from the outcomes. Examples of community solar efforts include community shared solar, community-owned solar, investing or crowdfunding community-based solar uh, energy projects. There's a difference between community-owned and community-shared programs. Um, community-shared participants purchase and, uh, uh, or subscribe to participate in a common solar system and directly receive the benefits of their participation on their utility bills. Whereas community-owned solar, it's owned by the community and it enables multiple individuals to share collectively in the management and control, deriving both financial uh, benefits from lower electric bills or return on their investments or net metering credits. And the last type of, so to speak, community solar is when you invest or utilize crowdfunding mechanisms uh, to support community-based solar projects. Um, for example, it allows interested investors or partic participants to use easy platforms to support uh, specific projects. Uh, the funds invested and the resulting earnings are not uh, connected, or, so to speak, they're unrelated to a participant's energy costs or energy bills. Other similar programs rely on a donation model in which interested participants donate to the construction of a renewable energy system in a community, sometimes receiving a tax reduction or a gift or return. Thank you so much for coming today to come together to talk about solutions. Um, this, I'm on the steering committee of the Local Clean Energy Alliance in addition uh, to working with Revolve and uh, it's my pleasure to <coughs> see so many people here. The conference sold out, um, which is fantastic and it goes to show that people in the Bay Area are really putting on their thinking caps and coming together and to, to talk about this stuff, so it's, it's very exciting to see. Um, my name is Andreas Corellas. I'm the founder and executive director of Revolve. We're a nonprofit organization uh, founded in 2011 uh, based in San Francisco. Um, and, and as uh, Linda talked about, there are a lot of different uh, approaches to community solar and a lot of different meanings to different people. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is Revolve, and, and this is sort of one way that it works. But I think in general, community solar is something that um, involves the community in one way, shape, or form, whether it's um, organizing to make a project happen, financing a project, um, realizing the benefits of those projects, um, and a number of different ways. But really, it's about building community at the same time, uh, building economic and environmental benefits. So first, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, why I started Revolve. Um, many of you uh, remember in the excitement that we felt in 2008 and 2009 uh, when we elected a new president and there was talk about um, climate legislation and there was talk about um, the international uh, accords in Copenhagen that were going to really do something about climate change. And I know a lot of us also felt a massive amount of frustration um, when those things did not come to pass. And there was a big um, sort of uh, feeling in the movement at the time that we did everything right. We, we really pushed very hard, and, and yet the solutions didn't happen the way we, we wanted them to. And so I, I personally felt disempowered and felt like there was this um, gap between what we needed to have happen and, and our ability to make that happen. And so I started to think really uh, carefully about what could we do as a community um, that doesn't rely on external help? What could we do together 
that can actually build solutions in our communities that can benefit our communities economically, environmentally, and actually start to reduce carbon and actually start to build the clean energy economy that we want. And so um, I started thinking about climate change, and there's climate change is a vast uh, there. There are a lot of different components that come together to make it a very difficult challenge, the, the, diff the most difficult challenge that we've uh, ever seen. And two of them, I think, are, are really key. Um, one of them is, is easier to solve than the other. One is a, is a technological fix. Um, we live, uh, we need to switch from a dirty energy economy to a clean energy economy as fast as we can. Uh, but thankfully, we actually live in a culture where technological revolution happens pretty much all the time. We've seen a number of technologies sort of um, uh, evolve in our lifetime uh, dramatically, and I think that renewable energy in particular is, is poised to do that. We, we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes. So that's actually the good news. Um, the other issue around climate change is, is more of a psychological issue. When we look at the question of how do we solve climate change, it's so big, it's so vast, it has so many inputs from so many people across various sectors that it becomes overwhelming for an individual to look at and feel like they can have any sense of agency or have any sense of ability to change it or have any sense of empowerment. And so we really need to start thinking about how can we empower individuals um, and communities to do something about climate change that gives them um, the ability to say, we can do something. And by doing that, you then engage them uh, in the movement building. And so it, I came up with this idea for Revolve um, to try to address those two uh, needs. This is uh, a basic kind of demonstration of how our model works. Um, first, we empower people with the ability to invest in uh, local solar energy projects in their community or in someone else's community um, through crowdfunding. So we raise money through crowdfunding, people donate their money, um, they give, they get a tax deduction, and that money goes into this pool of money that we call the Solar Seed Fund. We use that money to build local solar energy projects on nonprofits and cooperative organizations that serve their community. Those communities sign a 20-year lease they save money, about 15% or more, on their energy bill during that time. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they pay us back over time, back to the solar seed fund. During that time, we raise awareness about solar energy in the community that we serve uh, by bringing in, um, we have uh, outreach events, we have materials, we're trying to raise awareness about solar. We bring in local solar installers um, that can have uh, that can offer residential and commercial solar leasing to um, those community members so that more people in the community can also go solar. And then lastly, and this is uh, one of the interesting facets of the model, is it's a revolving fund. So the solar seed fund uh, that's now receiving lease payments from the community centers gets reinvested into additional projects. So each project that we invest in earns a return. So that money from the solar seed fund is constantly growing, investing in more and more projects going forward. Uh, two projects. Uh, we have our first project we completed in June was a 10 kilowatt project at the Shaw Anderson Dance Center in Berkeley. Uh, we raised that money for the project from 300 people um, who donated to the campaign and volunteered their time. Uh, we now just signed up a few days ago our second project, which is the Kahila Community Synagogue in Oakland. It's going to be a 26 kilowatt project, um, and I hope you all will help us to uh, make that a reality. And just one thing about this, about these two projects, to, to show the powerful dynamic of the revolving fund is that these two projects, we, we, we will raise money for two projects, but together over that 20 year period, these two projects combined, the lease payments coming from that will be able to finance eight additional projects. So we raise money for two projects and that will actually multiply into 10 projects and those 10 projects will continue to multiply, providing more and more communities with solar power. Um, so we've been in the press, the New York Times, Scientific American. We've received generous um, funding from the San Francisco Foundation, from the Yahoo Employee Foundation. I was recently selected as a Toyota Together Green Fellow. Um, so I am very excited to be discussing this all with you, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much.
So due to unforeseen circumstances, Shiva Patel, co-founder and worker member, wasn't able to make it today, so we're going to be speaking on his behalf. My name is Dave Ron. And I'm Ashoka Finley. Oh, can you hear us all right? Do we need a microphone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 you do. And we are both with the Energy Solidarity Cooperative. We were established uh, last year in the spring of 2012, and we're based in Oakland. So we're going to start off with an image that we're all too familiar with, an image and reality that uh, resonates with us because it speaks to a number of different facets of our energy system. It talks about how heavily polluting it is. It talks about centralized power production, of which our electrical generation system is heavily reliant upon. And it talks about a system that is um, affecting and degrading the health of our communities, um, of the environment, and is disproportionately affecting communities of color and the working poor. So when we talk about how do we move away from these models, um, and it came up during the plenary today, we need to be thinking about these as degenerative systems, our electrical energy uh, generation system as degenerative, and how do we move towards more regenerative systems? And that's the context through which uh, ESC has had its impetus, this idea of regenerative systems. So by that we mean decentralized, democratic, local systems of electrical generation. And just to give some ideas around um, how do we move towards those kinds of models, those alternative models, uh, when we talk about that within the fold of Energy Solidarity Co-op and folks that are working within a lot of the uh, environmental justice spaces, that means moving away from profit-driven models and more towards community and member-driven models. And moving away also, avoiding this carbon myopia um, of, uh, of traditional types of models and centralized production towards models that are more reliant and more based around uh, the intersections between labor and ecology. Yeah. Avoiding that false divide that environmentalism is against labor. I know that becomes a large narrative that happens and kind of becomes um, an impediment to creating social change because a lot of the more traditional blue collar jobs are in these heavily polluting industries. So how do we figure out ways to transform their, their roles in our energy system to be more slated towards renewables? And so just given the time constraints, we're just going to jump right into what our model looks like given those that kind of context. So right off the bat, ESC is a multi-stakeholder cooperative, which means that we have a number of different stakeholders that are pieces to a puzzle we see as necessary in order to um, move towards these decentralized democratic models of engagement with uh, community power. There are three different stakeholders that are involved in the cooperative. Workers, such as ourselves, consumers, and that would be the community organizations and individuals uh, within the, the communities, predominantly communities of color and working poor communities, um, who would be directly benefiting and operating these systems, and community investors. Now each of these three stakeholders bring to, bring to this model uh, different tools and different resources. So for the worker members, we're kind of facilitating the process of this energy transformation through our consulting services and the various skills that we have. Um, on our team already, we have engineers. I have an education background for our partnerships with different schools. Um, Dave has an engineering background in energy production. Shiva has a background in energy policy. And the reason that we've constructed the style of team is because we realize that there's many facets and many layers to transitioning to renewable energy. Um, and so we provide sweat equity to the cooperative um, that allows it to keep functioning and allows it to keep moving forward. We then have uh, consumers who are providing member equity. So they're, they're directly contributing a, uh, um, a member membership fee to the cooperative to become full-fledged consumer members, and the sites themselves are housed where, essentially for our first phase, are housed where the community organizations are based. There's obviously a, a host of other resources that the consumer members are providing. That's, that's sort of primarily uh, at the first, at the initial stages of partnership, what the consumer members are providing. And then community investors, what we work with at this point is a crowdsourced financing model. We'll get that in just a second. Uh, we're going through what's called a direct public offering, which allows California investors, basically anybody who lives within California, to invest in these models uh, towards community power. And what are the benefits for each of these different stakeholders? So for our workers, it involves 
uh, people are direct owners of the organization. They have a single vote, each worker, and they get revenue associated with, with the projects. Um, consumers, likewise. Community investors, however, are not, they don't have a direct governance stake in the cooperative, but they do collect revenue uh, during the payback period of the project. Mm -hmm. And I think the rationale behind this was that we are trying to balance the influence of money and the influence of um, other types of resources, and maybe human or social capital that can be leveraged to make these projects succeed. Um, and it creates a nice balance, we think, um, in a nice balance between those two aspects. Um, rather than abandon a bunch of slides, I'm just going to start talking faster. So let me <laughs> let me know if that's okay. Um, when because there's a lot of discussion around community solar and community power in in various spaces of the private sector and the nonprofit sector, we saw it as very important at our initial stages to define what it means for us. And for us, we talk about this framework of the three A's: autonomy, accessibility, and accountability. And that means for us, community power involves an autonomy, the ability for community groups to be able to uh, have locally relevant decentralized, democratically controlled systems. Accessibility, that, there's a financial piece of that, but a lot of what we do with our energy consulting services and the educational <coughs> development, uh, particularly that Ashoka is working around, is about demystification of technical knowledge. So the groups that we work with, building that capacity internally. And accountability has everything to do with that, that direct stake. So community groups feeling that they have ownership and stake in the model. So we did have in this presentation, we were going to walk through a project and how it, how it works. Maybe we can get to that. We have three different phrases. I feel like that may be incidental um, <laughs> at this point. Right. Yeah, we only have one minute left. Um, yeah, there this are... This is the most important one, yeah. I think. So in terms of financial and legal barriers, access to capital is a huge uh, barrier at the formative stages of a cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, Specifically because we sit in the middle ground, right? It's it's much easier for people to understand if we're an NGO, like foundations would be like, oh, here's money. Well, kind of, obviously, you know, it's <laughs> not like that. But, uh, and then banks, if we're, you know, a corporation or someone that can sell them a share of our company, then they're into it too. But if we're the middle space where it's like, well, if you give us money, we can't give you part of our company because we have worker members. Um, there, it's a little harder, and so we're, we are finding some trouble in, in getting bridge funding and startup financing for this type of model. Thanks to the organizers and all of you participants, we look forward to the Q and A period where we can have a broad discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Leela Turner. My journey started in 2010 where I began the East Bay Green Job Corps program. Wanting to pursue my career in solar, I continued various education by taking different training courses. I began climbing the ladder for three years now. At this point, October 2013, I am proud to say I am administrative assistant for Solar Richmond as well as a worker owner candidate from Pomoja Energy Solutions. On the behalf of both programs, Pomoja Energy Solutions and Solar Richmond, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. At Pomoja Energy Solutions, our mission is to provide each customer with high quality, cost efficient solar service while promoting a long term economic development in underserved local communities. With Pomoja, a cooperative, our business model is to allow share wealth, business ownership that promotes long term sustainable growth in the community. During the candidacy period, we train the candidates in OSHA 10, CPR first aid, business management, as well as work on residential projects, and meet once a week to develop a routine on meeting about concerns and future projects we have down the line. Since the founding of Solar Richmond, our social mission has been to serve low economic residents, particularly men and women of color. Our environmental mission is to promote solarized homes throughout the Bay Area. We work with other community organizations that also provide training, job readiness, and job placements, as well as offer other resources that's needed for any participant. Uh, Solar Richmond also partnered with Grid Alternative to solarize low-income homes around the Richmond neighborhood. For Pomoja, like most businesses, starting from the ground up, we face many financial challenges. First, finding low interest rates and loans, and getting a line of credit. 
We are fortunate to have legal support through the East Bay Community Law Center. Sushil Jacobs is our main line of support when it comes to our legal needs. We, are, we benefit from his pro bono work tremendously, and we are very grateful to have Sushil Jacobs as well as the East Bay Community Law Center for our law, law support. We are an example of a community-based project. Solar Richmond Promoji provides training such as solar training, job placement, serve as a solar advocate. Most recently, we integrated meditation and mindfulness throughout our organization. And by the end of next year, we would like to have or aiming towards 10 worker owners or 10 worker owner candidates. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and have a nice day. You talked about the two projects you've implemented already. I'm curious about what's the process your organization utilizes to select these communities? In order to be a recipient of a revolved solar lease, um, the organization has to be a nonprofit organization uh, or it can be a cooperative and it has to serve the community. So there has to be a, a community base there um, that, that we can kind of work with. Um, so we select those communities. We've been doing outreach to communities that, that fit that bill. Um, and we also have been approached by communities that um, are interested in our solar lease financing. Um, and so right now, uh, it's sort of both of those avenues. But, um, but yeah, that's those are the main criteria. Do they have to own the building? Um, they don't necessarily have to own the building. We would prefer it if they did, just because it, it shows that they're going to be there for a long time. Um, but we also have a contract for people that don't own their building. I think since you bring up solar leasing, I may know the answer, but I wanted to ask you, what happens at the end of the term of the lease? And I'm asking this in particular because of the idea that, you know, we were talking earlier about distributed versus, um, what was the other word? Decentralized. Decentralized um, power. And the idea being if, if we have a lot of uh, solar being spread because of leases, which is great because there's more solar, but then who actually owns it? So what happens at the end of the term of the lease and you know, d does the organization get to own the panels? Uh, you know, yeah. Solar leasing is, is a very common um, uh, process now, and, and there are some leading companies that, that are really kind of um, uh, really revolutionizing the industry uh, through their solar leasing model. Um, one of the unique model, one of the unique aspects of Revolve is that as a nonprofit organization, uh, our contract is slightly different, um, whereby it's a, it's a lease to own model. So at the end of a 20 year term, uh, the community center owns it outright. So um, there's, no, there's no fees, there's no um, fair market value price at the end of the lease. So once they've um, gone through the 20 year lease agreement where they're saving 15% or more, at the end of that, they own the system outright and they will continue to get free energy for as long as the system continues to produce. If your organization, Andreas, is a nonprofit and you're working with nonprofits, are you guys able to capture the tax benefits for solar? Yeah, so, um, so currently the Revolve model does not rely on um, the tax credits, the investment tax credit um, from the federal government. So uh, we've been, as a nonprofit, we're able to keep our costs low. Um, and we also actually have been partnering with another nonprofit that's, that's done our installation, which is called Sunwork Renewable Energy Projects, um, based in the Bay Area. Um, and they have a great model whereby they bring um, volunteers to the job site and they train them um, on how to do solar installation. And so that's also kept the cost low. Um, and so you know, we're exploring other models, um, but at the moment we have not uh, taken advantage of the tax credit. Hi, Cyan Dandridge from the <clears throat> Marin School of Environmental Leadership and Strategic Energy Innovations. I'm interested from the Energy Sol Solidarity Collaborative. I, I would love to hear an example of a project that you've done. I know that you kind of were breezing through your presentation, but I, I mean, I got the idea of it, but I don't really get the meat of it. Um, so we have not completed a project yet, but are in the primary stages of developing one. Um, and a relevant example for you might be, um, we're develop developing a partnership with Street Academy here in Oakland. It's an alternative education school. Um, and through our partnership, we're developing a lot of curriculum. And so our central focus is the idea of knowledge and skills transfer. Um, and so, Part of the process happens through 
curriculum that's rooted in science and technology, obviously, but also kind of the social conditions um, around energy. So we've been talking about how has energy and the a energy acquisition affected history? How does that, why talking about foreign policy, these types of things, so the students can understand full spectrum how energy affects our society. Um, and then on the other side of it, we're looking at implementing things like uh, energy audit training um, and the whole range of, of technical skills that are needed to install a solar project um, will be taught to the students as um, the project moves forward. So from inception to completion, the students will be a part of the entire process um, in order to make them kind of agents of their own kind of energy transformation. Um, thanks so much for the information on the panels. So really appreciate it. And I, I just wanted to ask, so I, I think all three examples are great examples of new models that need the, the type of models that we need to be experimenting with. And it's very exciting that all three of you exist. And I wanted to throw this question out to whoever wants to answer it. It's, a, it's really um, kind of what's the biggest challenge for getting to scale with these kinds of models? I feel like, um, you know, we need as many new experiments as, as possible, and then there's also just the, um, the, the, the crisis at hand just requires, you know, moving quickly and being able to have mass adaptation of new models, uh, and so just like one, I'm sure you're thinking about it, but, you know, what, what do you see as the major obstacles to being able to um, expand exponentially? <laughs> Oh, well, I could start. Um, just off the top of my head, like some of the background stuff that I know, I'll say financially is a major burden for most of the people that would like to start a business from the ground up, um, as well as finding participants because we are a co-op. There are a lot of people coming in and out during the child period and candidacy period. We're trying to figure out who is able to fit in the program and if the program fits them as a part of the co-op. So finding strong members who are really really determine like uh, I'm not sure if it was said here but sweat equity you have to work sweat equity before you get an actual profit so finding that medium between financial as in like donations loans in that nature and also participants who want to become inside of the co-op um, I would also add um, just general awareness of the differences right um, I think when people conceptualize energy, especially if they don't live next to a refinery or some type of coal mining operation, it's invisible to them, right? Their energy comes from transmission lines and that's it. And so when we think about when we think about the transition, it's very easy for people to conceptualize megawatt scale in some desert or something. Um, but I feel like it's harder for them to understand what like a distributed generation actually looks like um, because there's not too many models of it happening. I mean, there's, you know, the hippies down the street that have solar on their house and have had solar on their house for a while, but and that's changing, sure, through like different solar leasing models, but really in terms of market penetration, I don't know if there's enough examples of distri distribution um, that have allowed people to conceptualize, oh, we can produce our own energy, and like we can be the owners of it, and it can actually support us. If I can just add one uh, quick thought to that, uh, to Ashoka's point. It's just that early on in the stages of, uh, especially the Energy Solidarity Cooperative, when talking about, well, wouldn't it be great if community groups had the opportunity to own and operate their own systems, there was a lot of pushback from groups that said, I, we don't really think community groups want that. Like, there's a reason why third-party solar leasing has saturated the residential and commercial solar market, because people just don't want to be able to own and operate their own systems for a 25-year lifetime. But, you know, we came at that question thinking, have you asked community groups whether they want that? Like, is there, is there a choice being provided? Or is it one of these sort of uh, optics around, well, there really isn't a choice, and you wouldn't want the choice anyway, because it's kind of more of a burden than it's worth. It's, you know, more of a burden of responsibility. And why don't you just leave that to the people who have the knowledge? And, and expertise, right? And expertise, which is, you know, obviously a really condescending type of attitude. Um, so the ability to have choice <sighs> is I think something new for a lot of or, uh, community groups that are interested in solar. And that's where we come in in terms of uh, the idea of like, is this model replicable? The question is, do folks want it? And if folks want it and are interested in, you know, putting in some of the sweat equity and doing some of that knowledge, sh knowledge sharing between our cooperative and the community groups that are partnering with us, um, then, you know, sort of the sky's the limit. Well, I think there's a, a, couple, a couple sort of, um, key points there that, that we've all kind of touched on. Um, I think one, obviously, is money. 
Uh, and I think that you know all of these models are kind of using innovative ways that um, we recommend. I mean, in general, the, the push to create a technological shift is going to require financing. That's sort of one of the underlying components. So it's really what we're trying to do with with the crowdfunding and. Is and, and many groups are doing this, which is really great. Is that we're we're opening that up to the crowd to say, okay, do we all support this, and can we all kind of chip in and make this happen quicker? Um, you know, another thing is, uh, and, I, and I think another way to scale in terms of um, actually getting community projects out there, getting the communities to, to sign in, is, is through partnerships. And there are great environmental organizations that have national um, reach, uh, community organizations, community organizations of faith um, that have you know, numerous um, organizations around the country. That, that are looking for ways to go solar in, in, in a cost-effective way. And so I think um, partnering with organizations that can really kind of help spread this um, financial model is, is one great way that, that um, we can look to scale. And then I think the other question, which is just sort of a bigger question around solar and scaling solar, is this awareness question that, that we talked about and um, the fact that uh, exactly what you guys said, which is that people think of solar as this weird thing that it's not, you know, it's not mainstream or it's not um, cost effective or it's not for me, it's for those other people. And, uh, and, and as, a, as a movement, we need to address those myths and we need to raise awareness about solar um, and make it seem as, as common as possible and, and make it seem as, and, and demonstrate the benefits to as many people as possible and allow them to, um, to take it and run with it. So that's sort of our, our collective kind of need to scale. Sure. Yeah, thanks. So, um, <laughs> so our, our 26 kilowatt solar project on the Kahila Community Synagogue um, is uh, the contract is signed, and we're going to start uh, the crowdfunding campaign most likely December 1st. Um, so, but I recommend that you go to our website, revolt.org, sign up for the mailing list, and we'll definitely let you know. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, so our so Revolve model is completely donation based. So, people, again, it's, it's about empowering people. So, people who want to do something about climate change and say, I have. Um, this amount of money that I want to see a local <coughs> solar project built. I want to see renewable energy um, uh, happening. So they can donate that money. They get a tax deduction, um, and then that money uh, and that money is, is being invested. It's earning a return. It's not being paid back to them. It's being paid forward to the next community. So I have a question for everyone, including Linda. I noticed in your introduction you talked about different types of community solar projects, including utility sponsored, and I know that's getting into a little bit of a controversial area, but I'm curious about what you consider community solar to be or what are the requirements at the local Clean Energy Alliance. Some of us looked at uh, SB 843 last year and kind of came up with a list of, of things that would really make an ideal community project like, you know, the, the ownership is in the community and even if possible the financing. And I'm wondering what you all think and, and you know, what people think of, for example, utility sponsored projects or how how could that be a community solar project? I can start off that uh, response. I think a community, community solar has different key attributes depending on the community. Um, at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, we focus on ownership. Um, but other groups um, are not necessarily looking for ownership. Um, at the state level, California passed SB 43, which is the Shareable Renewables Green Tariff Program, and it does not uh, uh, provide for ownership opportunity. However, um, that legislation is going through or will be going through rulemaking at the CPUC, which is the California Public Utility Commission. And there will be an opportunity for cooperatives and community groups or communities organized as special purpose entities to advocate for basically an in or an opportunity to be developers of community solar projects. So the, at, at least in California, the devil will be, in, in, the detail will be uh, developed in the next 12 months. Um, so we're not sure uh, what that program will look like, but a green tariff program as described by the legislature does not, this is, in my opinion, it's not a community solar uh, or community renewable energy program. It essentially is allowing rate, rate payers within the utilities service territory to elect to get power from a renewable energy project 
but it might not necessarily be locally, it might be far away. Um, so there will be no opportunity for a community to manage, to control, or have any decision-making uh, power. So um, as far as self goes, we don't believe that the legislation is written. It's really community-related. <laughs> um, but we might have an opportunity to improve that at the CPUC level. I'm not sure that responds to your question. But key attributes would be locally, you know, uh, that members or members in the community have decision-making uh, power, that they uh, have leadership, that they have uh, opportunities for control would be, which would be, you know, some in, uh, ownership interest in the project, in addition to getting a credit on their utility bill. One challenge to that legislation also to community solar in California is virtual net metering. Right now, virtual, virtual net metering is only available for multi-tenant residents. So if you know a community, a neighborhood in Oakland, community members want to create a special purpose entity and build a solar system in uh, empty lot or in somebody's backyard and get credit all the members of that community who has have an ownership interest in that community, it will be virtually impossible because there's no virtual net metering policy in California for residents that do not that are not living in individual homes or or um, and that are not in a multi-tenant building. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to focus on sort of the successes in your messaging. Um, for these different projects and your organizations that are doing this work. What are some of the things that people have said got them involved? So either signed up or got them to donate and that sort of thing. Like what, what is, is sort of working in getting these people involved in community solar? The whole thing of being a cooperative ownership, going out there, working in the community of Richmond, most of our cooperative members, our candidates are coming in from across the tracks, literally. If you know where we're stationed, we have a verbal track and it's an apartment complex right over where they actually come across the verbal tracks and like, I wanna sign up for Solar Richmond. <laughs> Solar Richmond, um, they, yeah, literally, it's hilarious. I am originally from Oakland. I went to Treasure Island Dab Corps. I always wanted to do the carpentry program. I didn't really like how they structure for um, their teaching their students. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna leave, but I would like to still continue my journey for work on my hands, construction, energy efficient, just environmental justice, period. So I came out here and I involved myself in the, I always forget this name, but it's a Berkeley, Berkeley Youth Alternatives. And they told me about the East Bay Green Job Corps program. And ever since then, Miss Akili Carter, she was like, I need you. You're the only female in this class. I'm like, I, I noticed that, right? I am. <laughs> so from then on, she was like, I really need you. I really see the potential in you. And just hearing that in the community, there's someone that sees the potential in one, not only one person, she sees potentials in everybody. But just hearing her say, I can see the potential in you. And three years down the line, she sees, still sees a potential in me. And where I came from, from uh, three years ago to now, just having someone in your corner. I love her. That's that's Mama Keely to me. So if you ever see her and me together, oh, that's Mama Keely to me. And um, just the different projects we did. Easter Hill, so the Richmond did a training program where they actually went out to the community right up like a few blocks down from Southern Richmond and they solarized a whole community comp or well, community center and it's like a housing dwelling dwell over there where it's powering most electricity over there and just ownership. We love and promote ownership. We love and promote. Um, different ethnicity back ethnicities background, economic background, doesn't matter if you have one shoe on or two shoes on that day. We just want you to come in and learn something and have ownership and be proud of it. And it's not we're not gearing you towards solar, not at all. We're just gearing you, gearing you for an education. And any way you can enhance your education and your training to go on further, that's what we want you to do. But of course, we want you to go to solar first. But any way we can help and guide you to go the right way, I think that's a great way for people to come into the community or any program showing that you're willing to help. Doesn't matter what you look like, where you're coming from. You got two shoes on, one shoe on that day, like I said. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, in terms of you know what's gotten people to kind of connect to our work, I mean, it's, I guess it's hard to say because you don't always know. Um, but I think at least what was interesting is the first crowdfunding campaign that we did. We didn't know where the community um, 
we didn't know which community was actually going to get the project. We just decided to raise the money before we, we had identified the first project. And so what that does is it, it shows that the people who donated, they, they love the idea that they can do something, that they can have a tangible impact in the community, um, and that they can do something about climate change, they can do something about um, the clean energy future, despite where, where the community actually is. Um, so that was that was sort of a big indicator for us, and I think that's, that's kind of the messaging that, that we're going to continue to focus on. We did a, a few months back, we did a successful Indiegogo campaign for $15,000 just to get some of the costs covered for our direct public offering, which is going to give community investors an opportunity to actually put in more uh, revenue-based contributions towards these projects. And I think hearing from a number of community investors, you know, we hear, we hear different things from our consumer members, but for, from the community investor side, a lot of that discussion has been around, well, uh, there, there is solar financing, there is uh, crowdsourced financing for solar, but how do we think about it in terms of, and this has come up in a number of uh, discussions recently within environmental justice spaces as well, how do we think about it in terms of scaling out as opposed to scaling up? How do we think about it in terms of uh, connecting with community organizations and groups that are really about this idea of ownership and democratic control um, and having that just spread like wildfire as opposed to uh, these, uh, this idea of like, oh, there's an idea that gets a lot of traction around crowdsourced financing and then we just scale up automatically. So that has been a, a huge piece of that, um, that conversation that we've noticed community investors are really interested in. Thank you so much to all our panelists. Thank you, uh, audience, for being here. It was an interesting conversation. I'd like to end with a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.